Over the last uh, number of weeks, we've been going through the book of Ephesians. I've been really enjoying it, but and it's an amazing book. It's full of rich treasures. I believe God would have us just take a little bit of a break. We will get back to it because I want us to focus on who the Lord is. And I've been thinking about this for a while, that we may know him. Paul said that I may know him. That's a third, the theme of our year, that I may know him. And if we're going to make him our direct focus, I can't think of a better place to do so than from the book of Psalms. You see, the Psalms are a collection of 150 songs full of theology. And they paint a clear, beautiful picture of who God is. After surveying all 150 Psalms, and yes, I went through them all, I found at least 13 attributes of God that they clearly brought out. These songs of David proclaim the righteousness of God, the holiness of God, the mercy of God, and the eternality of God. And many other attributes, of course. But one of the main attributes that the Psalms bring out is the omnipotence of God. What's omnipotence? It means God is all powerful. The Psalms keep bringing out the power of God. And so this morning I want us to focus on the 46th Psalm as we look on the, um, upon the omnipotence of God. Now we have to remember that the Psalms were put to music. And the 46th song is divided into three parts which commentators call strophes. A strophe is a section or a verse which repeats the same music. It would be like Amazing Grace. Amazing Grace has sweet the sound. I'm not going to sing it for you, glad to know. <laughs> Amazing Grace has sweet the sound to save the wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. The strophe one repeats the strophe again, different words. The sound is the same thing. Psalm 46 is the same thing, should I say. It has three strophes. And each verse repeats the same music, and each strophe in this psalm makes use of the same music, of course, and, and each ends with a pause, and the pause is Selah. Selah is a pause at the end of the strophe. See, so you pause, and maybe the instruments are playing, and, and uh, I'm doing this like the piano, but the instruments are playing, it's more like a harp, right? And then, and then they go on to the next strophe. So the inspired title then of the psalm states that it was music, and, and uh, it was handed to the chief musician for the sons of Korah. It says, a son of Alamoth. One commentator states that Alamoth was probably, probably denotes parts sung by female voices. Strong, strong, important, strong, translates Alamoth as girls. So therefore we conclude that this song, Psalm 46, was sung by sopranos. Regarding the content of the song, because of their doctrinal position, most commentators try to see this psalm as historical. Placing it in the context of the Babylonian invasion or Jehoshaphat's deliverance from the assault of his neighboring countries. However, I take the Bible literally for what it says, and so I take a different position. And so it's very hard to find commentators to find to take our position, but my position is this is not historical, this is actually prophetic. So we're going to take a look at the prophecies in Psalm 46, which is actually quite exciting. And have, it gives us a lot to look forward to. The all-powerful King of Kings who's coming. There are three strokes in the Psalm, as we said already, and so there will be three points in my message. And today, let's look at Psalm 46, and we'll read it. Psalm 46 begins, and I'm going to read the title because it's inspired, to the chief musician for the sons of Korah, a song upon Alamoth. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore will not we fear, though the earth be removed, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, though all the mount though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof. Selah. There is a river. The streams thereof shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacles of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God shall help her. And that right early. The heathen raged. The kingdoms were moved. He uttered his voice. The earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Selah. Come, behold the works of the Lord, what desolations he hath made in the earth. He maketh wars to cease unto the end of the earth. He breaketh the bow and cutteth the spear in sunder. He burneth the chariot in the fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Selah. 
Let's go to the Lord in prayer, can we? Father in heaven, we want to thank you so much for this psalm. And I think this psalm is a tremendous blessing to many people. But I pray when we've gone through it together as a congregation, I pray that we leave a bigger blessing to people. And we leave here rejoicing in our God who is omnipotent. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. First thing I want to share with you, number one, because God is omnipotent, we need not fear trouble. Because God is omnipotent, we need not fear trouble. Again, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Verse 2, therefore will we not fear. Some live in fear of the most unlikely. I remember hearing this story, I thought it was very funny about a, a man and he was broken into, the house was broken into and, and uh, the, the burglar was downstairs and, and he went down to the burglar and he says, could you please come upstairs? My wife has been waiting for you for years. <laughs> Finally you've arrived. You know? So people live in this fear that they'll be broken into and they, young children are sometimes afraid of monsters underneath their beds. Perhaps I have an over and not active imagination when I was a child, but perhaps I watched too much rubbish on TV. But some adults are afraid of things. Adults are afraid today, if they're into conspiracy theory, and many are, of the Great Reset. All the banks and the stock exchanges will collapse. I, I, I heard this in economics class. I heard this in business studies class. I, some fill their day, I heard it in the financial reporting class. And some adults are, 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 are fill their day with conspiracy theory, but they don't realize that the Great Reset and this new world order that they, has been spoken about for, for hundreds of years, like books in my office that go back to the 16th century, 15th century where they've been talking about this. It will happen. We may see it in our lifetime, we may not. But verse 2 is hyperbole, and hyperbole is exaggeration. It, it amplifies that which is minutely possible. Look at verse 2. Therefore will we not fear, though the earth be removed, though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea. The point that Samus is making is that the earth is probably not going to be removed in our lifetime. And he's not going to see the mountains cast into the sea. This is poetic language, and Paul used similar poetic language in 1 Corinthians 13, verse 2. He said, though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries, and he didn't understand all mysteries, nobody understands all mysteries. And he said, and though I have all knowledge and have all faith so that I should remove mountains, and to my knowledge no prophecy or, or no apostle or no prophet has ever moved a mountain and stuck it in the sea. I haven't heard of that. And have not charity, he says, I have nothing. It's hyperbole. It's, 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 we understand it's poetic language to exaggerate things to bring out a point. What's the point of the psalmist? I will not fear. I don't have to be afraid. Why? Because God is our refuge and strength a very present help in time of trouble. Some live in the, in, in the fear of the most unlikely, but then some live in fear of the very possible. Look at verse 3. Though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof. I mean, waters do rage, mountains do shake. Ireland in Donegal had an earthquake yesterday. Did anybody know about that? It hit 2.5 with a Richter scale. I don't know what it shook, but the point is, it's a bit of excitement for people. What was that? That was the breeze. Though. That was the breeze, yeah. You're not meant to be. Oh, wait, 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 leave that. Anyway, but the point is this. Mountains do shake. Earthquakes do happen due to plate tectonics. Jerusalem, from where David wrote the Psalms, had several earthquakes over the years. You know that? The Al-Aqsa Mosque that sits upon the Temple Mount was destroyed three times over the past 1,300 years. Mountains do quake. Earthquakes do happen. The sea does roar. The Sea of Galilee, which is really a fresh water lake, but it's called the Sea of Galilee in the northern part of Israel, had storms that would come across it because of the wind currents coming over the, the cliff edge, and, and uh, they would have these unexpected storms. And the disciples knew all about it, didn't they? The sea does roar. The leech, one of the commentators, refers to it as the pride of the sea. I thought that was so interesting. And brethren, the pride of the sea puts people in fear, and the pride of man puts people in fear as well. Would you agree with that? Sometimes people lift themselves up and put us in fear. 
We might live in fear of failing, failing in our schooling, failing in our job. We might live in fear of not being able to pay our bills. We might live in fear of the landlord ending our rental agreement or the bank foreclosing on our loan. We might live in fear of not having enough money to retire on or maybe live in fear of what am I going to do when I retire? People live in fear. We might live in fear of finding acceptance among our peers or maybe not being the success we want it to be. There are many people who live in fear and uh, there's always someone there who's standing in pride and they want to humble you that little bit more and keep you in your bondage to fear. Some people live in fear of the most unlikely and then they live, others live in fear of the, most, the very possible and so many live in between. The fact is that bad things do happen to good people. Bad things do happen. And the problem is that we can exaggerate those things in our minds and make them so much bigger than they really are. And we can give ourselves into anxiety and fear. And those are the times that we need to trust in the omnipotent God. Look at verse 1. God is our refuge and strength. Say it together. God is our refuge and strength. And it goes on to say a very present help in trouble. A refuge is a shelter, literally a place to flee for safety. It was a high tower, a fort, or a fortress. God is not just our refuge. He is our city of refuge. When the Lord prepared that land of Israel for his people, he knew that they were going to do wrong. He knew they were going to get themselves into trouble. He knew that things would be broken, laws would be broken, people would be killed, and accidents do happen. People can die accidentally. But there was this law that if somebody uh, was, was to be killed, that they were, had, there was an avenger that was allowed to go after them and, and execute them. And that's the way it was back then. And so if it was done accidentally, this person who killed the person, the manslayer, so to speak, could run to one of the 48 cities of refuge as a place here where he was safe, where he couldn't be executed. And the avenger, the slayer, the avenger couldn't touch him because he was in a place of safety until judgment was given out. Folks, I want to tell you something. God is a place of safety. God is our refuge and strength. <laughs> The omnipotent God, omnipotent, all-powerful God is our refuge and strength. He is our strength. He is the strength to the weak and the defenseless. Literally in the Hebrew, and I love this, we can rely on his strength as if it were our own. Let me say that again because it's so good. We can rely on the strength of the Lord as if it was our own strength. It's not our strength, it's his strength. He's our refuge and strength. When we are overwhelmed, we need his strength. When we feel like giving up, we need his strength. And there are many who do give up. But we don't have to give up because there's a strength in someone who is so much greater, so much stronger, so much more powerful, so much more loving, so, so much more gracious, so much more kind, so much more compassionate than we are. His name is Jesus. He's our refuge and he's our strength. When we feel like a complete failure, when we keep messing up, who's there to help us pick up the pieces? God is our refuge and strength. Who is there to lift us up? Our God. The omnipotent God is our refuge, he's our strength, and he is our present help. There is no point in having a fortress if you can't get into it. God is a present help. Not in the future, not in the past. Right now. He's there no matter what the need, whether we are pursued by our enemies, oppressed by our circumstances, or distressed by our shortcomings. God is our refuge and strength. A very present help in trouble. Because he is omnipotent, we need not fear trouble. And trouble will come our way. But we don't have to be worried about it. Number two, because God is omnipotent, we can enjoy You know, one, um, 
a, a friend of mine, he, he has these one-liners, his name is Joe. Uh, um, Cause you know Joe from football, right? He has these one-liners, and uh, really you know Joe. And uh, Joe says to me, um, he says, do you know what the best pillow is? The best pillow at night is a good conscience, a clean conscience. I thought, that's a great one-liner. But I want to tell you something. Yes, a clean conscience is, is, a, is a great pillow, but I think there's an even greater pillow. The Lord for refuge and strength. Because no matter what's going on, you can have a clean conscience and still have fear, right? And I want to tell you something. God is our refuge and strength, and we can enjoy his peace. Look at verse 4. There is a river. I love it. It's just like, whoa, after this storm, there is a river. The streams thereof, whereof shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacles of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God shall help her. And that right early. The heathen raged. The kingdoms were moved. He uttered his voice. The earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. And then there's that pause. Selah. What a contrast between verse 1 and 3 and verse 4. We're talking about the storms coming. Maybe the storms on the Sea of Galilee. We're talking about the earthquakes coming. Maybe the earthquakes that happened in Jerusalem. And you compare that with that. A peaceful river. You know, I, I love to read commentators and their take on verse 4. And they're looking for historicity. They're looking for things that happened in the past. And so um, they're, they're straining to figure out, what is this river that we're talking about here? Barnes says there is no allusion here to any particular stream or river. And many will say that other major cities had this rivers go, these rivers going through it, like Babylon had the Euphrates. And what does Jerusalem have? There's no river. Jerusalem was unique among historical cities in that it had no great river. It had one tiny thread of water, the waters of Siloam, that which went softly by Jerusalem. What if our text is not talking about a, a current river? And this is what excites me. What if this text is talking about a future river? Turn your Bibles, please, to Ezekiel chapter 47. We're going to look at some prophecy here. Keep your marker there in Psalm 46. Ezekiel chapter 47, please. Ezekiel 47. Ezekiel 47. <clears throat> Ezekiel describes in detail a new temple that's going to be built. There's four temples. The first temple was Solomon's temple, destroyed. Second temple was Ezra's temple, destroyed. Solomon's temple was destroyed by the Babylonians. Ezra's temple was destroyed by the, by the Romans. And now there's a third temple. That's going to be the, the temple of the tribulation. But there's a fourth temple. This is the temple speaking here. And obviously the tribulation temple is going to be destroyed. There's a fourth temple here. And uh, we're not going to look at the dimensions of the temple. But I want to read something here in verse 1. Afterward he, Ezekiel's prophesying, and he, he brought me again unto the door of the house, the house of, the house of God, the temple, right? And behold, waters issued out from under the threshold of the house eastward, for the forefront of the house stood toward the east, and the waters came down from under, uh, from the right side of the house at the south side of the altar. Then brought he me out. This is an angel bringing Ezekiel around in this vision. He brought me out of the way of the gate northward and led me about the way without onto the utter gate by the way that looked eastward. And behold, there ran out waters on the right side. And when the man that had the line in his hand went, and forth, went forth eastward, he measured a thousand cubits. Now, a thousand cubits is 1,500 feet. And so we're talking about a quarter of a mile. And he brought me through the waters and the waters were to the ankles. Verse 4, again he measured a thousand and brought me toward through the waters and the waters were to my knees. Again he measured a thousand and brought me through the waters were to my to the loins. After he measured, we're talking about a kilometer here by now, after he measured a thousand and it was a river that I could not pass for the waters were risen, waters to swim in, a river that could not be passed over that began in the house of God. It began in the house of God. This is future, this is prophetic. This has not happened. This is not to be spiritualized. This is literal. Jesus Christ is reigning on earth. This is going to happen. Think with me for a second. Verse 5 looks forward to the millennial reign of Christ. Jesus Christ is going to reign on earth for a thousand years. But right now, Christ is with us spiritually. Hebrews 13, verse 5, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Jesus Christ is in this room right now. Aren't you glad about that? 
He's beholding our order of worship. He's been blessed when our hearts are lifted up to him in praise. And whatever worship and adoration we're giving to him, he's watching it right here, right now. Yeah. Right now. He is with us spiritually, but, but he will be with us physically and personally on that day. The one who spoke all things into existence is going to reign from Jerusalem. And we're going to be there looking at him. If you're saved, that is. If you're born again, if you're washed in the blood of Jesus. If you're forgiven, if you've been saved, if you're a born again Christian, you're going to be there. The one who can the sea with the words of his mouth will be there. And the heathen think they can do whatever they want. But they don't realize that the Lord omnipotent reigneth. We're going to keep, I'm going to flip back to Psalm 46. You can stay there in, 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 verse, in uh, Ezekiel for a second. But Psalm 46, listen to this. The heathen raged. The kingdoms were moved. He uttered his voice. The earth melted. This is Jesus Christ coming back, brethren. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. That's going to happen. And when, the, when the Lord speaks, all the heathen can do, all the wicked can do is retreat in fear. Now look at the whole picture here, brethren. When we know God is with us, we can have peace. Now, the Bible says in, 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 in the book of, of, of uh, um, um, Zechariah, all the nations of the earth are going to gather against Israel to destroy her. You think that anti-Semitism is bad now? It's going to be on another level on that day. When, when the Antichrist reigns from Jerusalem, there is going to be horrendous anti-Semitism. Anti they're going to gather around Israel to destroy her. And they're going to be in shaking with fear. And they're going to think, this is over. And Jesus Christ is going to come back in his glory and he's going to rescue them. That's the picture here. That's the picture here. And Psalm 46 says, God is our refuge in and our strength, a very present time, in a very present help in time of trouble. No matter what's going on in our lives, brethren, God is there. Yeah. And it may not look like he's there, but he's there. And it may look like it may look like you're finished and it's over, and you're gonna be squashed, and you're gonna be crushed, and your life is over, and all your goals and dreams are over, and there's nothing left. God is our refuge and strength. You can trust him. He has a plan. He's going to work it all out. And he's there to lift you up when everything else is there to crush you. God is our refuge and strength. When we know God is with us, we can confidently rest in, in peace, undisturbed. Now listen to this. Even in the midst of... Where our faith becomes real. When we're going through it. And it's overwhelming. And people look at us and say, where are you getting this peace from? And maybe with a tear in your eye, you whisper back, God is my refuge and my strength. And he's there helping me through it. Brethren, why respond in fear when we can respond in faith? Because God is omnipotent, we need not fear trouble. Number two, because God is omnipotent, all-powerful, we can enjoy peace. And finally, because God is omnipotent, this world will see his peace. Let's go back to verse 8, Psalm 46, verse 8. It says here, Come behold the works of the Lord. What desolations he has made in the earth. He maketh wars to cease unto the end of the earth. He breaketh the bow and cutteth the spear in sunder. He, bury, he burneth the chariot in the fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Selah. With his perfect power, the Lord is going to stop every war. I hear people saying, we just need peace. I remember when I was a kid, they had CND, the campaign for nuclear disarmament, because people were looking for peace, but the Bible says there is no peace unto the wicked, saith the Lord. 
There's going to come a day when there will be peace. And when Jesus Christ comes back, there will be peace. I can promise you that. How do you know? Because the Bible says it. Amen. On February the 24th, 2022, Russia invaded the occupied parts of Ukraine in a major escalation of the Russo-Ukrainian war, which begun in 2014. The invasion has resulted in tens of thousands of deaths on both sides and instigated, instigated Europe's largest refugee crisis since World War II. When Jesus comes, comes back, it's over. The conflict is over. On the 15th of April 2023, only a few weeks ago, conflict between rival factions of the military government of Sudan began when clashes broke out in the capital city of Khartoum and in the Darfur region. Close to a thousand have died and thousands have been injured. But when Jesus, comes, Jesus Christ comes back, all conflicts will cease. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 2. And keep your marker there in Sam in case we go back there again to Isaiah chapter 2. Isaiah chapter 2. We've got to see this psalm as prophetic, not historical. If all this is historical, you miss the power behind it. Look at, look at chapter 2. Look at verse 1 here. Isaiah chapter 2 verse 1. Let's turn there. The word that Isaiah the son of Amos saw concerning, the, the Jude, concerning Judah and Jerusalem. And it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains. And shall be exalted above the hills. And all nations shall flow into it. And many people shall go and say, Come ye, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of God of Jacob, of the God of Jacob, Jacob and he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he shall judge among the nations, and shall rebuke many people, and they shall, listen to this, beat their swords into plowshares. Those weapons are going to become farm implements, brethren. And their spears into pruning hooks, used for tilling the land. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. I'll be so welcome to this earth, no more wars, amen? I'll be so welcome. With his perfect peace, the Lord Jesus Christ is going to stop these things. With his perfect power, should I say, he's going to stop every war. When God speaks, Every man must listen. See, God is speaking silently through his word. But people have to blow the dust off their Bibles to know what he says. Isn't that true? People don't know. They don't read their Bible. Oh, you can't believe this book. Have you ever read it? No, but I can't believe it. But you've never read it. How can you make statements about things you've never read? But they don't read it. They don't read about the prophecies. They don't read about the prophecy of, of, of Christ coming into this world. Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. They don't read about the virgin shall conceive and bring forth a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. They don't read about those prophecies. So they didn't know about it, and they didn't realize that Jesus, when he came into this world, fulfilled hundreds of prophecies. Miraculous, impossible. But if they don't read the Bible, they don't know that. They don't realize that this is the book of life, so to speak. Now, there is a book of life, and I'm not talking about that, but this book is a book of life in itself, isn't it? And this book is the book of redemption. The blood of Jesus can be seen all the way from Genesis all the way to Revelation. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. This book talks about a savior. It talks about someone who came into this world and who died on a horrendous cross for all our sins. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. We have gone astray. We've gone every one to our own way. But Jesus Christ took our sin upon himself. This book tells of this. But if people don't blow the dust off this book, how will they know? God speaks silently. God speaks silently through his preachers. There are people, you go into Dublin City, and most weeks there's somebody out there preaching the gospel quietly in some street corner, and people walking and by him not listening to what he has to say but what he's saying is the most important thing they'll ever hear in their life yeah. but they don't realize it God is speaking silently 
God is speaking in churches like this where the gospel is being preached, where the call to repentance is given. God is calling every man everywhere to repent of their sin and turn to the Lord Jesus Christ. Turn from your own ways and turn to Jesus Christ. Realize you're wrong and he is right. Repent. Jesus is the Savior. Turn to the Savior. That message is going forth in this country, in many churches, and in many countries, but many are not hearing it. Many people do not realize that God is speaking, mm -hmm. but there's going to come a day when every man shall hear, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, and all God's people said, Amen. Because that is true. It is going to happen. And verse 4 tells us, Isaiah chapter 2, he shall judge among the nations. He shall rebuke many people, and they shall beat their swords and into plowshares, their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up a sword against nation. They don't need a G7 summit. They don't need a G8 summit. They don't need a, a G20 summit. They need a Jesus summit. Do you understand what I'm saying? Only Jesus has wisdom. Only he has the wisdom. And he will bring peace. That would be perfect peace. There'd be no more war. You know, maybe you're in a personal war. Maybe you're in a war with God. And you're putting it up to him. And you're fighting him. Brethren, if that's your war, you're in the wrong war. <laughs> you're not going to win. And if you're in a war with God, I appeal to you to surrender. Stop fighting God. Give in. And submit your will to the one who is omnipotent. Because we all know he's going to win in the end. Let him get the victory in your life right now. With perfect power, he will stop every war. But also with perfect power, he's going to disarm every man. We're going back to Psalm 46 in our Bible. Psalm 46 in our Bibles. He's going to disarm every man. Look at verse 9. He will make wars. He maketh wars to cease unto the end of the earth. He breaketh the bow and cutteth the spear in sunder. He burneth the chariot. In the fire. He's going to disarm everyone. You know, you're not going to need campaigns for nuclear disarmament. You're not going to need campaigns for people to, 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 to have gun control laws and all that type of stuff. And we're living in a different era right now. I totally get that. But there's going to come a day when there's going to be perfect peace and everyone's going to be disarmed. We, will not, we were not created to hate. We were not created to kill. We were not created to fight. That's the way of Cain. They were Cain and Abel. Remember what happened with Cain and Abel? Cain killed Abel, right? God didn't make us that way. We were created to have peace with each other, brethren. We were created to love each other. And when the children of Israel entered into the promised land, they did so by war. And brethren, the reason why they did so by war is that's all the world knew. But God wanted to start with the nation of Israel all over again and bring peace to the whole world to the nation of Israel. God said to Abraham, in thy siege shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. And their entrance into the children of the children of Israel, into the nation of the promised land, into the promised land, was to bring the world to a place of peace. It didn't happen. It was supposed to, but it didn't happen. Brethren, this world does know peace and it will never know peace until Jesus comes back. And do you know what? He's going to disarm every individual when he comes back. And maybe you are one of those people. Maybe you need to put down your weapons up, of, of, of your arms and your weapons, so to speak, and surrender. Those weapons of resistance. Maybe they just need to go down. With his perfect power, he will stop every war. With his perfect power, he will disarm every man. Involuntarily, I'll say. Now is a good time to do it voluntarily, I would say. And finally, with his perfect power, he will rise above every man. Look at verse 10. It says, be still and know that I am God. I love that verse. It puts everything in perspective, doesn't it? Be still and know that I am God. 
Satan in the book of Isaiah says, I will. He has five I wills and it's blasphemy against the Lord. And he's completely wrong. I'd say the only I will that there is for him is he will be cast in the lake of fire. <laughs> but God says his I will right here. And because he's the king of kings and the Lord of lords and because he's omnipotent, it will happen. He says, I will be exalted among the heathen. I can't wait for that. I will be exalted in the earth. Jesus Christ, brethren, is going to be exalted. And we hear his name blasphemed. We hear his name mocked. I was passing out leaflets when a guy was preaching on the street in Dublin. And this guy came up to me. And he was just mocking. And he's blaspheming. And I want to tell you something. There's going to come a day when his knees are going to bow. And his tongue is going to confess Jesus Christ as Lord. And I hope it's not too late for him when he says those words. Because it will be involuntary at that time. Right now we have the opportunity to voluntarily say, Lord, you are God. You're the King of Kings. You're the Lord of Lords. The Lord omnipotent reigns. Jesus Christ is going to rise above every man. The greatest problem right now is that the man refuses to give God his proper place. That's the biggest problem we have. You watch the biggest problem in Ireland? I'll tell you what it is. Man refuses to give God his proper place. What's the biggest problem in England? I'll tell you what it is, that the English refuse to give the Lord his proper place. What's the biggest problem in America? I'll tell you what the biggest problem in America is, that the Americans refuse to give the Lord his proper place. What's the biggest problem in the African countries, or in the Philippines, or in any other country you, do, you, you, you care to mention? Every one of these countries refuse to give the Lord his proper place, but there's going to come a day when every knee shall bow. And every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And he will be exalted. He will be. He is out of sight right now. He's out of mind. But that is not the case if you're a believer in Jesus. If you truly are born again, he is not out of sight and he's not out of mind. He's in your heart. And you love him. And you express your love to him. And you enjoy him. Because he's not out of sight. He's not out of mind for you. And you know what? There's going to come a day, very, very soon, when our faith will become sight and Jesus Christ will take the center stage of this world and he's going to take the center stage of the universe and everybody who is anybody is going to rejoice on that day. Romans 14 verse 11. For it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. And everyone who holds the name of Christ in reverence, will say, Amen. 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 If you said amen, amen, it's only because the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Yeah. That's why you said Amen. Because you know it's true. <coughs> and this is what Revelation 19 verse 6 says. And, and that's the God of heaven, the God of creation. It's the God of grace and the God of salvation. Paul wrote in Philippians that I may know him. And I want to ask you this morning, do you know him? Do you know this omnipotent God of whom I speak? Do you know this all-powerful God of whom I speak? Do you know him? I hope you do. But do you face obstacles that are just impossible? Like, I don't know how I'm going to get through this. Does fear grip your heart at times? Does fear stop you doing the things that you know you should be doing? Psalm 46 presents God as our refuge and strength. If God is our refuge and strength, then we don't have to fear. Isn't that encouraging? Let me ask you another question. Are you really at peace in your heart? Are you at peace? Do you yearn for that day when Christ comes back? Will you enter into that eternal bliss? Is that your focus? I can't wait for Jesus to come back. Is that your focus? If your God is omnipotent, then you can enjoy his perfect peace. And this world will see peace, won't it? If God really is omnipotent, and this is where it all comes down, 
It boils down to one thing. If God really is omnipotent, we can trust him 99%. I, I, I got that wrong. No. If God really is omnipotent, we can trust him what? 100%. We can. Don't battle him. Don't struggle against him. Trust him. Trust him for your soul. Maybe you say, well, I have. I repented of my sin. I repented. I put my faith in Jesus. I know I'm saved. I know my soul is with him. Well, then, if you trusted him with your soul, trust him with your life. The Lord omnipotent reigneth. If he's powerful enough to save your soul, is he not powerful enough to rule your life? Trust him. And this is my encouragement to you. If he is the Lord omnipotent, he should have the freedom and power to work in every single detail in every area of your life. Trust him. Trust him. He is omnipotent. You can trust him. And if you do trust him, let your actions follow your faith. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, can we? And let's praise God for being so.